God is here.
Faithful God, we thank you that you have given us your promise, and we know that you will never go back on it. We can count on you to be there for us in any difficulty and in every joy. You have brought us through the storms of adversity and given us the perspective to enjoy the goods of the earth as gifts from you, not as items we deserve. In your son's name we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in our responsive psalm for today, Psalm number 28, verses one and two, and six and through eight. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, do not refuse to hear me. For if you are silent to me, I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleadings. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. So I am helped, and my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his inheritance. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Let's take a moment to greet each other. Good morning. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of announcements this morning. The Benevolent Baptist Society annual meeting normally held on the first Sunday of March is actually rescheduled this year. It will be on the last Sunday of February, February 26th, immediately following the worship services. Members of the Benevolent Society will receive a notice in the mail about the meeting. Our January mission is collecting food items for the St. Mary of the Bay Food Bank, and our goal is to fill at least one food bag a week. This afternoon at one o'clock here in our sanctuary is an ecumenical prayer for unity service. Multiple churches will be joining here this afternoon. There will be a coffee hour immediately following. Let us take a moment now to be in the spirit of giving as we deliver our offerings to the Lord.
Gracious God, thank you for the gifts you bestow upon us each and every day. Help us to be more aware of your many gifts and guide our lives in such ways that we and our gifts may be gifts to others. Take now our lives, dear Lord, and our gifts, and consecrate us and our gifts for new and faithful service to all. Lord God, remind us too that in our giving, there are many in great need this day. May, be, may we be of service to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join in our hymn of worship. We have heard the joyful sound, number 486, in your hymnal. Our scripture this morning is a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiple exultation, multiplied exultation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of your burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Median. 
May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Reflecting on the scripture, light and darkness are universal themes. If you're in a dark place, a room, a cavern, a forest, or even a closet, your first instinct is to get light. But depending on the nature of the darkness, not all light is equal. You wouldn't build a campfire in a closet. Oil lamps are kind of smelly, but they're great for garages. And some electric lights just waste energy. A torch is great for the Olympics, but doesn't light up a room really well. So you have to pick and choose what kind of light you're going to use. The text says the most appropriate light for the kind of darkness we sometimes experience is the great light of the Lord. As Isaiah praises God's light, he lays out for people how God will deliver them, and without, those without hope will suddenly be filled with joy. Right now, let us each contemplate how God's light has shone in our lives as we enter into our silent meditation. O oh Lord God, when you walk among us, you make us hear, make the deaf hear and the blind to see. You exhibit deep compassion and love for those who suffered 
And so we pray now that you would pour that same compassion and love out on those among us who are suffering. There are physical ailments, there are psychological wounds, there are grief and stress and anxiousness and despair. You know our hearts and our hurts. Please move among us and let some of us be your hands and touch those in need. Lord, we ask you to join with people in our family who are facing health concerns. Kathy Francis, my colleagues Fabiola and Jesse. We ask that you be with Scott and Priscilla Amy. We ask that you be with Lindsay's colleague in a recent car accident. We rejoice that Joe is coming home and we rejoice with the Parker family. We ask your blessings on Cheryl Parent, her brother-in-law, Vincent. We ask that you especially be with the family of Rhonda Fortin, who you recently called home, and be with her family in this time of their need. Holy God, our days and times are in your hands. Help us to set aside our fears, to walk in faith, and to trust with you. We ask for the courage to live boldly, for the grace to forgive ourselves and others. Give us a spirit of expectancy, of watching for your presence in our lives and in the world, and responding to it with faith, hope, and love. For the sake of your Son, our Savior and friend, Jesus Christ, amen. Please join in our hymn of petition, In Heavenly Love Abiding, number 327.
Our second scripture text this morning comes from the book of Psalms, number 27, verse 1 and 4 through 9. The servant's mission. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make a melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. Our sermon this morning is called, titled Foxhole Faith. And I immediately um, connected with that. Um, my dad was a World War II soldier and he used to talk about foxholes. He was stationed in Europe, so I know what they are. They're horrible, I know, because he told me. Um, but Psalm 27 is for anybody who's currently stuck in a hole and it has maybe been so in the past or maybe fears themselves that they might end up there. The Psalm invites us to believe that our faith in God will never desert us no matter what happens. The Psalm's presumptive author is David. You might remember about David, king, ruler of Israel, formerly the slayer of Goliath, ancestor of Jesus. He doesn't like to be afraid. It's not comfortable for him. But in verse 1 alone, he mentions fear twice. Maybe because maybe why this is the psalm reads like this is a foxhole monologue. It invokes images of evildoers and adversaries. In this psalm, David longs for security, cover, shelter in the day of trouble. His heart faints for fear and all of his courage has vanished. He remembers the better days when he would visit the house of the Lord and be full of faith. For the most part, David is confident in the Lord, but here he's demonstrating his very human fear. Now he's in a foxhole. His enemies are attacking from all sides. And as you know, there are no atheists in foxholes, or at least according to war correspondent Ernie Pyle. It comes as no surprise that David is asking for support, the Lord whom he calls his light and salvation. So this psalm is really for anyone who feels that they're in the foxhole right now, or they felt like it in the past, and again, they're worried they might find themselves there in the future. Sizes of foxholes are are kind of interesting. They're not big at all. Troubles, however, differ greatly from person to person and day to day. When we're looking for a shelter, any kind of shelter will do. Not all foxholes are created equally, and some, for their foxhole, comes in a bottle or a needle. But literal foxholes, where they live, where little foxes live, there are very small and a human could never really fit into one. Typically, they're only about four inches in diameter, and you find them near the bases of trees. The den of a fox might be four inches wide, but they're usually about three to eight feet deep. They have multiple entrances, and their tunnels sometimes could be 50 feet long. Foxes rarely sleep in their foxhole, Rather, it's used to store food, raise their babies, or for escape. 
David doesn't feel comfortable in his foxhole. He feels hemmed in. He's in a very tight place, not a lot of room to move around, and he is incredibly uncertain about his future. And sometimes, like us, we have, like us, we have a lot to fear. No sane person walks alone at night in some cities. We have a fear of mass shootings, of climate change, identity theft, cancer, threats to our children, having enough money to retire, even going to the dentist or looking at the price of gas as you drive down the street. But what we fear even more is facing all of these things without the Lord. And that's where David is right now. Although he doesn't always feel like this, in some of his Psalms he feels ill, in others he is repentant and longing for forgiveness and a fresh start, in some he is defiant, asking God to destroy his foes, and in others he is quiet, he is at peace and relaxed, and finally in others he is positively ebullient and full of praise, but not now, not at this time. His foxhole is too small, his God is very big, but he's nowhere to be found right now, and David is feeling exposed and vulnerable. Stephen Covey is an American businessman who struck gold in the 80s by writing a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was required reading in a few of my jobs. His defining point was, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I know, I thought it was kind of funny when I read it too. But basically, what he's saying is, maintain your focus, keep your eye on the goal. David's foxhole revelation is similar. One thing I asked of the Lord, so he's got one thing in mind. If you were to ask the Lord for one thing, what would you ask? A lot of, in a survey, people responded to that question, and they said, we want more time but we are incredibly good at wasting our time. We want to be in our happy place, but some people just don't know what it is, where it is, how to find it, or even if they know if they're already in it. We want to be successful, but again, no, on, no concept of what success really means. We want good, healthy relationships, but we can't wrap our heads around the fact that that means to make sacrifices for someone. We want to feel safe, but we put our trust in alarm systems and cameras. We want to live in a civil society where we are accepting of others' politics and religions. However, we hear disparaging and pejorative words used to describe those views that may be different from our own. We admire self-discipline, but we have very, very little of our own, be it in exercise, our eating habits, or our lifestyles. We are a mess of wants and desires with corresponding vices, and the voices that are in our head or the little angel on our shoulder argue against the best choices we could make. We live in a paradox of doing what is bad for us and not doing what is good for us, but expecting the good for us ending. David said the one thing the Lord, the one thing he would seek after is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In other words, David was most happy in the presence of God and most unhappy when he was away from that presence. God's absences were usually a product of David's disobedience. In Psalm 51, we know that on, in Psalm 51, David had enough life experience to know that it was his best interest to be close to God and to keep God at hand as his closest advisor and protector. We know on an intuitive level, but perhaps contrary to the common wisdom of atheists and foxholes, we are atheists in a foxhole after all, not really believing that God can be in any real or meaningful way helping us in our day of trouble. As one observer noted, if the faithful truly and fully believed in a protective deity, why would they dive into foxholes to protect themselves? 
because a part of our brain knows darn well that if they don't protect themselves, a bullet cannot discriminate between those who claim faith and those who reject it. So why do the faithful dive into a foxhole with bullets flying around? Because the faithful aren't stupid. Because praise the Lord and pass the ammunition was something a lot of men said. Even David sought a cave in the mountains for safety. Why? For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. If God gives you the hiding place, take it. The main thing is to get a sense of the presence of the Lord, and then you can feel safe and at peace again. And when that happens, if it happens for you, the psalmist says, he will sing and make music, and he will make shouts of joy. And when rescued and safely in the house of the Lord, he will do nothing but gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. When you purchase a home, unless you make a cash offer, you're required to have homeowner's insurance. Even if you make the cash offer, get the insurance. Insurance policies cover a lot of damage caused by fires, lightning strikes, windstorms, and hail. Usually, however, damages caused by earthquakes and floods are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy unless you specifically request a rider for it. The psalmist may not like the trouble he's in, but it's his trouble, his foxhole, and he wants full coverage. He does not want to be afraid. In verse 5, we see that he uses three metaphors to describe the full range of coverage the Lord offers. Shelter in the day of trouble, concealment under the cover of his tent, and a refuge high atop a mountain. These images suggest safety from a powerful rainstorm, protection from a sandstorm, and safety above the raging waters of a river or a flood. David wants to be surrounded by God, don't we all? You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. The observant student of this psalm might have noticed this particular writing is not about David. It's all about God. The Lord is cited 17 times in 14 verses. The contrast is between the weakness, fear, pleadings, and prayers of a faltering human being, David, and a powerful deity who can remove the human from certain destruction, between a person who wants more than anything to shed all of the troubles he has seen, and a God who can give him safety in his divine presence, between the darkest night of the soul and one's light and salvation. Psalm 27 invites us to believe again that faith in God will never desert us, no matter what happens. Life without fear is not possible, but faith can keep us from reducing our lives because of fear. The psalmist comes to the conclusion, we've known all along, it is all about God, who God is, what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Amen. Please join in our hymn of benediction. What a fellowship, what a joy divine.
As we go forth, may the, Lord, may the God who has overcome the world give you strength and courage to face and overcome the obstacles in your life. He who calls you is able. Go out in the power of the Spirit to wade into the waters and cross over on dry land. Amen. Thank you.